Thank you, Thomas. Well, we'll go ahead and get started here with a word of prayer. Then we'll proceed right on into our questions. Let us bow. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for the sunshine this morning. It is good for a man's eyes to see the sun, we're told in your word. And we are reminded of all the many blessings that you bestow upon us. We're thankful for these. And we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for your great love for us. And for your mercy that endures forever. We're thankful for Jesus and the salvation that is in him. And we're thankful for our brethren. And for this opportunity to study your word. We pray you'll bless our efforts. Help us to learn and to grow in our knowledge and give us wisdom. And we pray that we will make application and bear fruit to your name's honor and glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm showing that we had uh, Billy Reese answered question number 31 last time. Is that correct? Um, Jason, did you take a question last week? You did? So, Samantha, I think that means we start with you with question number 32, please. Uh, Jason, what did you say? Did Okay, you, okay I misunderstood you. I asked if you took one last week. I thought you said yes. Okay. So, Samantha, hold on. Hold everything. Jason, go ahead. Okay, your testimonies. That's a good heritage, isn't it? Okay, number 33. All right, Danny, we'll move back to you. Is there a place, do you think, in the Word of God for a holy hatred, for abhorring what is evil? Do you believe that's true? Is the, does the Bible actually say that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil? Does it say that in Proverbs 8, 13? Uh, verse, uh, not verse, but question number 34. Now we're going over here. Celeste, are you ready with that one? You know, uh, Stan, you were teaching that time when we covered this, I believe, and we, we had a discussion on different kinds of fear, that, that what it would not mean, and yet we're to always have that reverence and godly fear uh, in the presence of God at all, time, at all times. Okay. Uh, Sister Edna, I'm glad to see you this morning. Are you feeling better at all? You are. Okay, number 35. Okay, and um, number 36 is next. Yeah, concerning all things. Number 37. Do you see repeatedly in every verse he keeps getting back to the Word of God and all these 176 verses? Next. Okay, good. Number 39. Okay, good. Number 40, please. Okay. 
Good. Number 41 is next. Okay. 42, please. Good. That was the sheen strophe, or the sin strophe, our, our, our Hebrew character. And then the last one is tav, which is like our letter T, the tav strophe. We have two questions on that one. Number 43 is next. Okay, and I spoke too soon about that. Uh, that's still in the sheen uh, strophe. Sorry about that. Number 44, though, is the last one. Okay. I don't know if you feel as I do. I'm at... Uh, Raymond, I almost feel a sense of sadness in being through with Psalm 119. I mean, I know it's not practical to think you just continue endlessly, but uh, Stan and I have, have taken our time really in covering this one just because it's how appropriate it is to me to be kind of the grand finale for our class, for our study on the Psalms. As I say, 176 verses divided into 22 sections corresponding to the Hebrew alphabet. And... Um, each of these having, each section having eight verses, all that begin with that respective letter of the alphabet. So it was a, at a time when not as many people read and fewer people still had copies of the scripture, the very way this was written was intended to be a helper in this long, in this lengthy psalm to remember these wonderful things about God's word and how it is to be treasured. And you know, we, we talked at various times throughout the psalm You'll see that word persecution, you'll see affliction, you'll see that there's adversity. Even in our study last week we noticed the princes, the princes that are persecuting him. So even apparently including in verse 161 those in positions of authority. So to me that just adds to what we're saying because not only does he say, and I know it's inspired, but not only does he say all these wonderful things about God's word, he's saying it under conditions where he's dealing with real life experiences. It's not, it's not just an easy thing and no, no adversity, but he's dealing with lots of, lots of problems. Well, let me ask you this, since we are kind of at the end of the way on uh, our study of the collection of Psalms, you know, we've, we've divided them in, into the 10 categories, 10 classifications. This last one was uh, the Wisdom Psalm. and. Um, that's kind of a, a segue into where we are as we continue. We've already looked at one book of wisdom, the wisdom book of Job, now the Psalms, and then the, the next one in, the, in that category is the Proverbs. So um, to conclude with a Psalm that is especially categorized as a, one of the wisdom Psalms, it might be a good point of transition, at least um, that's the way it's turning out to be, and I think, I think really it is. Again, are there any questions or comments on the Psalms or Psalm 119 or anything before we change gears here? I appreciate Wes helping out here with these. For those that need these hearing devices, they are a good thing. Uh, is that right, Joe? Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. And they've, they've helped a lot of people. And, of course, Larry's the one that's helped us with all that to get us on track and get us set up for this. So what, what I want to do, I've got a handout that I'm going to, to give at the end of class that's going to have some of the things on it that we are, that we are looking at now, not, not everything. But um, we're going to turn to the book of Proverbs. So I'm going to lay aside my... notebook on Psalms and make that transition with you to Proverbs. Are we having success, Wes? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your tenacity and seeing that through. 
One time I commended uh, Brady for his tenacity. We were doing chapter content, and he stumbled just a time or two, but he didn't quit, and he got through, and he did the whole thing. And uh, I said, Brady, I admire your tenacity. And he, he was whispering loud enough I could hear him. He asked the person next to him, he said, what did he call me? <laughs> but it was really a compliment. I love to study the Word of God. Love to study the Proverbs. I've mentioned before that it's, it's really a good practice. I, I know we're encouraging Bible reading with our reading schedule. Um, but in addition to that, you can do more reading. Each month has 30 or 31 days, except for February, you know. Proverbs has 31 chapters. And it's just a great practice. Just uh, watch today. Proverbs uh, today is uh, uh, the 6th. Is that correct? Or the 7th? Today is the 6th. So, for example, tonight if you were, were to read Pro Proverbs chapter 6, start there. And uh, just continue. And just each month, it's, it's really great to continue to review these things. Linda and I have been doing that for years. I don't mean we do that every night. But on a regular basis we do that. And um, we still see things we had not noticed before and, and make application to continue to learn. So I would encourage you to, to, to try that, to do that. Raymond, are you doing that? Good. I thought you were. That's why I asked you that. First thing in the morning. Well, I don't care when you read it. it that's, see, the thing is, you start out, you're fresh, and uh, you, you kind of remember it all day. You, you read it at night, and, and you know, you'll, you'll carry it with you as, you as you retire for the evening. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's look at the Proverbs here. Proverbs 1 and verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But you see a contrast in that, don't you? What does it say about fools? Same verse. What does it say? Yeah. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now, see, already we've learned two things about the Proverbs. We're seeing that what undergirds everything, but well, we get back to what we just said in Psalm 119 about the fear of the Lord. We've got that godly reverence. Because the point of it is, you could have a PhD, and we're not putting down someone that has a PhD. But you could have a Ph.D. and have a lot of knowledge about your field of, of study and discipline. But if you don't have reverence for God, your whole foundation is missing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you see, this is going to be talking about a lot of different things. Like if you have fields and, and, and you pass by and, and, and the, 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 your, your walls are down and the fields are grown up, it's going to be talking about a sluggard, you know, and that doesn't look good. You should be a good steward of what you have. And it, he, so he talks about the lazy person and go to the anti thou sluggard. See, the point of it is, I'm just using that for an example, but the point of that is not that, well, you know, you need to work hard and, and provide for yourself and earn a good living uh, and, and provide for your family. Well, all that's true. That's exactly right. But here's the foundation. The reason you should be a good steward the reason you should be a good worker, the reason you should have integrity on your job is because of your relationship to the Lord, because that's what God wants. And so it is when you look at all, this is going to be applying wisdom to all areas of life, but this right here undergirds it all. Kind of like when you get to the last chapter, and it talks about the worthy woman, the one that fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And in all of that, it's talking about her looking well to the ways of her household and all the different things that she does. What undergirds all that that worthy woman does is her fear of the Lord. So, but I, I said we learned two things. One is the foundational position of fear of the Lord. But the other thing that we're, we see already in this verse is the way the Proverbs are going to be teaching us a lot of times is by means of contrast. There are two ways. By the way, there are not three ways. There's just two ways. 
You're, you're going to see the wise person does this, the foolish person does that. The godly person does this, the ungodly does that. And so it's, it's going to contrast wisdom and folly and the consequences of wise choices and foolish choices. They're, and you, you see that here, that, that this is written for people. It doesn't matter, and I, I love the way the, the introduction starts. If, if you're, it uses the word uh, naive or, or the young man or the simple person. Would you look at verse 4 with me, for example? Proverbs 1 and verse 4. I'm going to be reading primarily from the New King James Version. But you can help me sometimes with, with your translations that will use maybe a different word for the same Hebrew word. For example, in, in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, To give prudence to the simple. Does anyone have a word, that, uh, a translation that says something else? Do you have naive or does it say naive in, in the New, New American Standard? And to the young man, verse 4 continues, knowledge and discretion. Now, this isn't saying a young person is stupid at all. But it's saying you're not just born knowing all these things. You have to, all of us have to learn. We have to be taught. And so we understand the word simple or naive, not to be somebody that's simple-minded. Again, they're just not instructed yet. And the, the young person with, that needs to be taught needs instruction, so it's for him. But there's something else in verse 5. Andrew, what does verse 5 say for us, please? Are you reading from the New King James? New American Standard. That'll be great. Go ahead. So you see both ends of the spectrum. If, if you're starting out, if you're at the beginning stage, you're a young person, naive in the sense of the context. Remember, everybody? Every passage has a context. So you're, you're young, you're at the beginning point, or you're more advanced. You're wise in your person of understanding. The point of it is you're going to learn too because you can become wiser. You can gain more understanding. So you see, the, this kind of person will appreciate the Proverbs. The, the young person that wants to learn, he'll, he'll, he'll take it in. He'll learn. The wise person, He's not satisfied. He wants to know more. He knows there's a lot more I need to know. But the one that doesn't get anything out of the Proverbs is the fool. You can be young. You can be at a starting point. You can be older and, and be wise and a person of understanding, and you're going to really profit from the Proverbs. But as long as you put yourself in this category of the fool, see the problem is not that he can't learn, not that God doesn't want him to. But what does verse 7 say? Fools do what? They despise wisdom and instruction. So, but again I'm saying there's a contrast. Here's somebody that's going to learn, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, uh, the beginning of knowledge I should say. The, the Bible also says it's the beginning of wisdom. That's in Proverbs 9 and verse 10. But here it's the beginning of knowledge. But fools aren't into that. It's, uh, and, and the Bible will talk about a fool that will rage or he will laugh when someone tries to instruct him. That's just a real good summary. He'll either get mad or he'll make fun of you and put you down, you know, just laugh at you. Well, all I'm saying is as long as you have that kind of heart till you, till you see that that's not working too well, that's not a good thing to do, you won't profit. But the text says otherwise, this book is for you. You're going to really profit. Well, um, so this, uh, this is a great passage. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. I, th I may have said wisdom earlier. It's the beginning of wisdom too. When I first started, I mean, I showed the chart. But here's the beginning of knowledge. So again, everything about knowledge in this book, everything of application, this is undergirding it. It may not say in a verse that's talking about um, not being security for a stranger that this is because of the fear of the Lord. But we know from chapter 1 verse 7 that that's true. Because your word means something. 
if you sign on a note for somebody and he doesn't pay, who's responsible for that? You are. So the point of it is, you're going to be someone who keeps your promises, so be careful not to make commitments flippantly, you see. Okay, well, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, here, it, it, if you were to use interchangeably in, as a synonym almost of, in the sense of all, A-W-E, all, reverence, and if, if you still use the word fear and just put godly fear, you know, it's, it's, it's an attitude. It's not uh, 2 Timothy 1 and verse uh, 7 uh, says that God has not given us a spirit of timidity. He's not given us a spirit of fear. Uh, John says there's no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. So there's the kind of shrinking fear like a, a slave would fear a, an abusive master. No, no, it's not that. But it's the fear that says, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. It's the fear that recognizes he is God and we are his creation. It's, I'll tell you, cases that uh, come to mind are just passages where people had an encounter with God. Um, in the book of Genesis, chapter 17 and verse 1, when God spoke to Abraham after an interval of 13 years and identified himself as, well, he said, Anoki El Shaddai, I am God Almighty. And then he said, Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. And it says, Abram fell on his face and communed with God. Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah saw the vision of the Lord there and the glory filling the temple, he says, woe is me, I'm undone. Um, and, and yet uh, you, you, you continue to see that uh, his, his lips were touched, he's cleansed, he's going to, uh, you know, it's here am I, send me. He's, he's the prophet that God is going to use. Um, when Peter caught the great catch of fish after he had toiled all, all night and caught nothing, and the text says, he fell down at Jesus' feet and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. In Luke chapter 5, that's godly fear. He wasn't asking Jesus to leave. And he wasn't wanting to leave Jesus. It's just that sense of awe and reverential fear for, for God. And, and it's not something you put on and put off. It's, it's, it's uh, there all the time. One of our songs says, a constant sense of thy abiding presence. And, and so it's, it's, it's just akin to godliness and our relationship with God and that respect that is always due his name. Um, is it Hebrews chapter uh, 12 that I'm thinking of, uh, uh, Greg? Hmm. Maybe not. I thought, I thought that was it. To serve him with reverence and godly fear. Is that not the chapter that I'm thinking of? I thought I could just turn right to that one. Anybody? Where, where are you at, Hank? Well, that's the one I was looking for. I said Hebrews 12, but when I turned to it, it wasn't there anywhere. How does that happen? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. Uh, that's what I was looking for. The last part of verse 28. Thank you, Hank. Where it says, let us serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12, 28. So, yeah, that's kind of uh, all, all that. All that, Greg, would, uh, I think, come into play in, in defining this. And it's, it's a good thing to take a moment to define it because it's so important. It, it undergirds everything we're talking about. So yeah, thank you, Hank. Hebrews 12, 28 is what I was looking for there. Yes, sir. I was afraid. I was afraid. I hid your talent in the earth. Lo, thou hast that which is thine. He wasn't commended for that kind of fear, was he? He's called an unprofitable servant cast out. That's a good point. So Josh is saying it's not the kind of fear the one talent servant had in Matthew 25. Good. 
But you see, when you think about that and what he said, you realize that what he, what he did not mean is I had such reverence for you. I, had, I held you in such awe that that's why I did not do what you said, you see. But yeah, it's not, it's not like that. And the Lord didn't accept that as an excuse. Okay, anything else? All right, let's see what else we got. All right. Um, is everybody warm enough this morning? Nice and warm, isn't it? Doesn't that feel good? Nice and warm. Okay, let's look at the Proverbs. They're written by um, Solomon and others. You've got Solomonic authorship, but you've also got the sayings of the wise. You've got um, Augur and you've got Lemuel that are named. And also it talks about Proverbs that Solomon wrote that were arranged by in the time of Hezekiah. So what that means in the days of Solomon, you wouldn't have had Proverbs 1 through 31 just like it is now. You'd have had, you would have had uh, some of those, but the final compilation seems to be in the days of good King Hezekiah. I think about Hezekiah and how this would fit in with what he was doing with his reforms. You remember he, he sets the, the, all the Levites back in order and restores worship and they're singing all the things he's doing at the temple that had been commanded in the days of David. And so you can see that as a part of his work of reformation, he'd want to compile and gather these. So Hezekiah is mentioned. So you don't want to, you don't want to think that uh, the final form of these 31 chapters was in the Solomon's days by Solomon, that there was some further compilation. So again, primarily we associate the Proverbs with Solomon. And uh, doesn't 1 Kings 4 say he wrote 3,000 Proverbs? and his, he wrote a thousand songs. We have three of his songs and we have one thousand of his proverbs that were selected to be included in scripture. So here again what we're talking about is uh, so far as the timeline is concerned the uh, reign of Solomon basically 970 or 971 to 931 BC. He dies at 931. Kingdom divides and coming on down to the days of Hezekiah, as I say, we'll see some of these are written in the days of Hezekiah. And so, again, just a bit of a timeline as far as where Proverbs fit in. What you have in the first uh, nine chapters, what you have is instructions that uh, I, underst I understand these to be written by Solomon as well, but the, the wording is, hear my son the sayings of your father. And so it's through, through and, and sometimes it is a wisdom is crying aloud. And so the idea is wisdom is, is instructing and this is to be received by the student. You will see that there's a sharp distinction in the writing of the first nine chapters and then when you get to chapter 10. Chapter 10 is where you start, it, let me put it this way, the first nine chapters are basically discourses about wisdom. I've got this morning a sheet of chapter content for you for the Proverbs and, and you're going to get off easy because chapter content is just for chapters 1 through 9. Now what we can do with chapters 10 through 31 is we can look at, like we did with the Psalms, we can look at classifications. But you, you can't really do much of a chapter content for, for 10 through 31 because it's, it's changing subjects so many times. It's a variety of topics. And so uh, what you see is discourses about wisdom in chapters 1 through 9. But then you have these pithy, the, the, the tierce statements, the, the kind of one-liners where the wise man does this, but the foolish one does that. Uh, in, in chapter 10 and verse 1, the, the way that it uh, starts out there, that's the one that says, a wise son makes a glad father, a foolish son is the grief of his mother. But then... Um, the next verse isn't talking about the home or mothers or why. It says, treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteousness delivers from death. So uh, you, you see the, the um, Proverbs of Solomon in, verse, in chapter 10 through 22, verse 16. But then you have, in the third place, you have what is called the words of the wise. And it doesn't identify 
who the authors are there. It's just a collection of sayings by the wise. Again, the hand of inspiration is in all of this. But uh, as we look at what the book itself says, we don't conclude well, Solomon wrote all of it because it tells you Solomon did write part of it and most of it. But this section of 2217 through 24, the end of 24, these are the words of the wise. And then the words of Solomon pick up, but these are classified as the ones that were collected by Hezekiah's men. Uh, I, I, would, I would suggest probably that would be the priests and the Levites that are so much involved in teachers, and they would be the ones that would be literary, uh, uh, skilled in, in the terms of, of being able to read and having access to scrolls and so forth. So Hezekiah's men, and as I say then in chapter 30, you've got, uh, and, and 31 you have the words of Agur, and then King Lemuel, and instruction regarding the worthy woman. So that's, that's an overview of, an, of uh, 31 chapters. But we're not done studying Proverbs yet. See, this just, this kind of thing, if, you know every, if, if we know everything that we've just said, we're just getting started. That's just helping us to get ready to study. That's what that does. Now, I said I was going to give you chapter content. And here you have it. In the first, now here again, this is already on a printed sheet. I'm going to pass this out so you don't have to worry about writing it down. But right now, just to, to consider it. Warnings against yielding to enticement. If, if my son of sinners entice you. They're going, oh, come along with us. And see, we all like to be included. You like to be accepted. Well, come along. We're going to, we're going to have one purse. We'll just kind of, you know, share and share alike. And it's going to, don't go with them. Their path leads to death. So, the benefits of wisdom, exhortation to love and faithfulness, chapter 4, recollections of his father's house. When you get to chapter 5, we read this one last night, it's uh, warnings against adultery. But it's not, just, it's not just don't commit adultery, don't watch out for these strange women. The Bible doesn't just condemn the thing that's wrong, it shows what is right. It talks about a man here who rejoices in the wife of his youth, and he loves her. And he's not going to give physical expression of love to somebody else. It's for her and her alone. And so that's, that's a, a really great passage. And then, um, you, by the way, you have a lot of, of that in terms of warnings against adultery and commending faithfulness and, 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 and the, the home as God would have it. Uh, chapter 6 is one of those that warns against the careless security ship that I mentioned just a while ago as well as slothfulness and also a warning against adultery. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? As it talks about the consequences that are, that are inevitable. Now chapter 7, well that's a great chapter. It kind of walks you through. Here's, here's a naive person. And here he is, you know, he's just kind of walking around and he's, you know, like uh, just, well, I'm just going to say it again. Yeah, window shopping, here he is. And, but what he is, he's putting himself in a position as it gets dark. Twilight, and it gets dark. But there's this, this woman that meets, oh, I've been looking just for you. You are so special to me. And my husband is gone. He's going to be gone for a good while. I've got everything ready. Let us take our fill of love till the morning. And, and just, it's, then he says, he knows not that he's going as an ox to the slaughter. It talks about his taking the path to her house. And he speaks of, of one who, that, whose, whose liver is pierced with an arrow. Now, Brother Pender, we've sort of gotten away from uh, providing our own food and dressing our own animals and stuff like that or, or, or personally uh, uh, slaughtering animals. But I will tell you this, if you shoot an animal through with, a, with, a, with an arrow or a rifle through the liver, he may go a little while, but he's dead. I mean, you can take my word for that. He's, he, he, it's not like, well, that will hurt. That would hurt. No, it'll be fatal. And so he uses that kind of metaphor here um, in, in, chapter, in chapter 7. Uh, so, but but, it, but it's, it's kind of like if, if, you, if you've done in school, you're, you're reading along, and, and the, the, the author of the book is wanting you to not just have abstract principles, but he'll, he'll let you do a case study. 
or you'll read about this case study. Here's what happened, and what should you do, or what should he have done. You know, everybody knows what a case study is, and that's kind of the, the approach that's used in chapter seven in Proverbs. It's a, it's really a case study of a man that was that was standing around where he had no business, and he put himself in the path of temptation, and he yields to temptation. And, and you're, you're, you're brought in, the, the narrator is, is bringing you in, and so you're wanting to say, stop, don't do that, and, and yet you, you, just, you just watch as, as he goes ahead and, and yields. So that's what chapter 7 does. So again, there's continuity to a chapter like that. He's, he's, uh, he's telling a story, he's telling a narrative. Chapter 8, the excellence of wisdom, how God made use of wisdom, and wisdom was with God when he created the earth, those kinds of things are detailed. Some of that kind of reminds you of uh, Job, where it talks about what Job did in creation. Then the last chapter, you've got wisdom personified. You know what personification is, don't you? You know, personification is a literary device where you, you take a, a, a quality, a, um, well, I mean, what is wisdom? Wisdom is a thing, but if, if you give it human traits and allow it to speak and so forth, then that's called personification. When you, when you give something that might, uh, might otherwise be abstract qualities of, of a person. So wisdom is personified as, as in the corners of the streets. And she's lifting, lifting up her voice. And she's saying, come here. Come and listen to me, those of you that are naive. Those of you that are simple. Come and listen. And uh, it'll do you good. But you keep reading. And there's folly. And she's also personified. And she says... Stolen waters. That's sweet. Bread eaten in secret. That's the thing to do, you know. And, and so you can see she's, she's calling out and she's appealing too, but what she has to offer is not any good. It sounds enticing, but uh, it, it's not good. So but that's the way this, this, uh, this section of these nine chapters will conclude. So, Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Other questions or comments? I guess you can tell I'm a little bit excited about our study of Proverbs. The Hebrew Bible um, the way the books get their name is from the first word in the text. Bereshit, in the beginning. And that's how we get the word Genesis. And that's, that's true consistently. And, and here the word is, uh, the word in the singular is mashal. Here is the word mashel. Mashel, shalomo. Ben David, Melech Israel, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. So Proverbs, the word mashal, mashal here in the plural, mashal, but mashal means it's, it's a governing principle, a ruling principle, mashal. And that's good to keep in mind, just know what the word means. I mean, we, we, could t we could talk about what, what they're about, and the, the, but if you just think of, of the Proverbs as a ruling principle, a governing principle, you see that what is being said is not that here you take this and in every circumstance, in every situation, this is always what's going to happen because it's not doing that. But it's saying here, here's what usually happens. This is what you can expect. This is the thing that is more, most predictable under these circumstances. So it is, it is a, it's a ruling principle. And um, sometimes these ruling principles will be, again, depending on, uh, depending on the, the circumstance, um, we might be told to answer a fool according to his folly, and the, same, and the verse right next to it will tell us not to answer the fool. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Proverbs 26, for example. Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5. Now these are right back to back. 
But again, we're talking about a, a governing principle, a ruling principle. Proverbs 26. And uh, Mark, you want to read verse 4 and 5 for me? Now let me tell you this, some of the rabbis looked at that and they said this part must not be inspired because there's a contradiction there. But if you understand here are ruling principles. Answer a fool according to his folly, the text says, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There might be a time that what has been said cannot be allowed to stand that there must, be, there must be a refutation of that. But on the other hand, every time someone who is foolish says something, d d does it deserve a reply? Does, I mean, does that determine? So, so you, oh, okay, well, you know, and, you know, there are a lot of times to be silent, to ignore it. Now, you, you say, well, well, how do you know? See, that's the key to it. It takes wisdom, it takes wisdom to know the difference. It takes wisdom to perceive, is this something that must be answered or is this something that is in the category of do not answer a fool according to his folly lest you also be like him. So if you want to be thought of as a fool also and be brought down on his level, you know, then, then it's like you've got to run and, and, and respond to everything that is said like that. So, but anyway, you're going to see, that, that's why I'm, I'm giving that an, as an example when I say it's a, it's a ruling principle, that it's not like rigidly this in, in every single situation because, for example, there we, we say, well, in this situation you should respond that way. On the other hand, this is, this is what would be the wise thing to do here. So that... Um, the, Again, meaning of the word, the ruling, the ruling principle. When I, when I look at any book of the Bible, I like to be able to see what is the purpose of that book. We, we looked at the purpose of the Psalms, and we saw they had many purposes, but I, th I, think, I think though many purposes are accomplished, that overall we, could, we would say that the collection of the Psalms is intended to praise the Lord. From beginning to end, the Lord is praised. So in the book of Proverbs, and you just see that on every hand. I mean, you could look at a lot of Psalms that say that. Um, when we looked at the book of Job, we saw how that couched in the dialogue between God and Satan, will a man serve God for naught? You take away what he has. You see, he'll curse you. We, we saw that the purpose of the book really is not so much just about patience or even about human suffering. But the purpose of Job was to answer the question, is God worthy of our devotion? Of our, when I say devotion, I mean everything. Because of who He is or because of what He gives us? And to show the correct answer, here's a man that everything he had was taken away and he still praised God. God is worthy of our praise and of our service and of our lives because He is God. So we saw that's the purpose of the book primarily. Now when you get to Ecclesiastes, you read all the way through and, and though you can have some glimmers, uh, th there are glimmers of, of, of what's coming and glimpses. Um, it's really when he says, this is the end of the matter, all hath been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments for this is the whole of man in chapter 12. Uh, there. And is that verse 13, I think? And so he, he waits to the end to just come right out and state the purpose of the book. Sometimes it's not always stated so clearly, but you'd be surprised how many times within the book the purpose is stated. For example, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8 and verse 1, of the things we're saying, this is the main point. So see, he tells you his main point. In John 20, verse 30 and 31, Many other signs Jesus did in the presence of His disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe. So He's saying, I've selected these miracles and recorded them to give you reasons for faith in Him as the Son of God. Now I say all that to say, 
that in the book of Proverbs, the purpose is stated here in the beginning in the first, really in the first six verses. And the device that is being used is, uh, it's, it's kind of a series of infinitives. Uh, you, you know when, when we use an infinitive, you usually have the word to attached with a verbal form, and that's the infinitive. And so you see that here in verse 2, to know. That's, that's our first purpose. That's stating a purpose. Here are the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. It is to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. So the purpose is to know, to perceive, verse 3, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. That's three infinitives so far. Verse 4, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. I know what you're thinking. Here he's making use of an ellipsis. You were thinking that, weren't you? Uh, that is where, uh, where a word is implied but not stated again. To give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. What does that expression mean by itself? To the young man knowledge and discretion. Well, not anything. But if you supply the verb that he's left out, to give prudence. See, that's, that's carried over, though it's not stated in the last part of the verse. So the infinitive, to give. And then this is a, a statement, this is a statement of fact of, of what people will do with the first four verses. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. I don't care how much you know, there is so much more you need to learn. And no matter how much you know, you need to be reminded of what you know so you don't forget it. So what we already know to retain it, we need to keep studying and review and refresh ourselves. But there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we keep learning. I learn things every day as I study. And uh, so, a wise man will hear and increase learning. A man of understanding will attain wise counsel. Now here's another infinitive in verse 6. To understand a proverb and an enigma. An enigma is something that might be puzzling. Something that you don't just see in quick reading what the answer is. You kind of have to ponder over it a little bit. You know, see, see what the point is. And, and here again, what is implied, though it is elliptical, the, the, the part where it says the words of the wise and the riddles, is not just a standalone thing, but it carries the infinitive to understand. So it's to understand the words of the wise and their riddles. So you see what he's done is he's used a, a series of infinitives to state, now here is the purpose of this, and a wise man, he'll, he will profit from this, that, that young man and naive man will also learn and he'll profit. But, but then, as we started out in the beginning in verse 7, there's that contrast. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But he hasn't said anything yet about fools. But now he says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. So all these things he just said, here's my purpose. Here's what this is going to do. The sad thing is, it won't accomplish that for someone that will not hear, that someone who resists, someone who will not listen. Well, what I need to do now, right now, is to get some of you fellows to help me. And uh, no questions on this handout. This is just introduction and chapter content, and we'll pass out questions next Sunday, the Lord willing. Thank you.
there's any announcements that needs to be made, I'd be glad to make them at the close of service. So if you'll pass me a note, I'll make those at the close of service. Also, if you haven't picked up a newsletter, you'll find one on the table of the left as you go out, as you go out the door. Uh, we'll be in preparing our minds for worship this morning. I'll be reading from the scripture. Then our brother Billy Reese will lead us in our first prayer. We'll be reading from 1 Peter, beginning in chapter 1, verse 17. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless con conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world by but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Our Father, God in heaven, we praise you as the creator of all, sustainer of all. We come before your throne this morning in thanksgiving, giving you thanks for all that we have, the very lives we lead, the many blessings we have in this life that make our lives easier, all the temporal blessings, but especially the spiritual blessings. For your son who gave up heaven, came, lived the life of a man, was tempted in all ways as we are, and was sinless and became the perfect sacrifice for all our sins. We thank you for your word, for the holy scriptures that we have we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together and worship. We thank you, Father, for the country we live in that affords us this opportunity without fear of outside interference. Father, we at this time pray for those of our number who are not well, those who are sick, that they may be, may be soon joined back to our number in health. We pray for those who are undergoing medical procedures, that those procedures will be successful. We pray for those who are grieved, those who are, have lost loved ones, who are mourning. We pray that you will grant them comfort as only you can. We pray for those who are traveling, that they will have safety, that they will be able to return to be with us in safety. Father, we pray for the one who will speak to us this morning, for our brother Leon. We pray that he will boldly say those things that he studied from your word that we are in need of hearing and that we will have the wisdom to take those things and use them as you'd have us to in our lives. We pray that all that we do here will be according to your will. And if we are found faithful at the time of our departing, that we will be granted that home in heaven with you. We pray this in all things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> this is the time that we set aside for the members here to do as we've been asked by our Lord and Savior to give back a portion of what we learned. If you're visiting with us, we are glad you're here. But we want you to realize we're not soliciting your money at this time. <clears throat> Please pray with me. 
Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for the opportunity to come here uh, to worship you, to study your word. We're thankful for this facility. We're thankful for uh, being able to do these things in a comfortable setting. Uh, we're thankful for the materials that are provided that help us to better understand what you want us to do. We're also thankful for the opportunity uh, as a group of your people here to aid those who are uh, making an effort to spread your word in other places. We pray that as we uh, present this offering at this time that it is, has been done already in a, in a way that is uh, pleasing for you. In Christ's name.
<clears throat> Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we stand before you again at this time, asking you to bless this bread, which to the Christian is representative of the body broken upon the cross uh, for our sins. We pray at this time, Father, that all the cares and concerns outside of this place be put aside and we can focus on that uh, great sacrifice that was made on our behalf. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Likewise, Father, we ask that you bless this fruit of the vine which represents the blood shed on the cross. Father, again, we pray this is taken in a way pleasing to you. In Christ's name.
your songbook, you might want to mark number 324 as a song after the lesson, 324. <laughs> Next we'll sing number 52 in the supplement, Until Then. We'll sing all three verses of the song. My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But
What a joy it is to be with you this morning as we continue in this part of the worship period. I'm delighted to see each of you, and that includes those that have been out due to illness and are back, as well as those who are still mourning the loss of loved ones. It's good to see everyone uh, back this morning as by the grace of God we've entered into the new year and uh, reflecting on the past blessings and thankful to him for present as well as the hope of the future that he grants unto us. Some months ago, there was a book that caught my eye that was a Kindle book. A lot of you have Kindles. And I have quite a collection, most of them. There are a few exceptions, but most of them are commentaries or otherwise biblically related books that uh, I found to be useful. And there was one that caught my attention. It was, it was called The Most Mist- Misused Verses in the Bible. And in the past I have done lessons dealing with passages of Scripture that are commonly misused. And I did something I don't usually do. Ordinarily, if I make a purchase, my library is, is really, and I don't say this in a boastful way, but over these many decades now, my library is, is really so vast that I, I have to be very selective. And, and I don't just flippantly buy a book. And really, it's, it's if I know the author, um, as well as uh, the particular uh, subject matter and uh, you know, those kind of things and the criterion where I select. But this one was solely on the title because I thought, well, you know, I, that might be suggestive to me of some ideas that I could use for a lesson. And so I, 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 made, the, I made the purchase. And I looked at the table of contents. And among the table of contents, there were, there were for, uh, for example, uh, subjects such as an eye for an eye. And what the author did, sometimes it would be a quotation from the scripture, but otherwise it might just be kind of rewording it the way people often say it. But I thought, well, that's a good one. He has a chapter on that. And that's, I'll tell you, that's a commonly misused expression. If you ever like to watch those gun smoke reruns, for example, or most any Western, you know, something happens to somebody, it's done unjustly, and he's not going to go through the due process and the law, he'll say the Bible says an eye for an eye. And he's using that like you just go out, if somebody killed one of your loved ones, you go out and kill them. The Bible says that, an eye for an eye. That's a misused passage because when you study Exodus 21, 22 through 25 in its context, what you're going to see is it's a judicial process and witnesses would be brought forth. And uh, so it wasn't just a case of personal vengeance ever. It was, and, and the text will say, and he shall pay as the judges determine. So that is, that is a misused passage. And speaking of judging, uh, one that's really misused and was included in the table of contents is um, judging others. I don't know how many times, you know, if you, if you say, well, according to the Bible, th- you shouldn't do that, or, or this is wrong. And someone will say, well, you know, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. And that's you, all you have to do is to just say something is wrong and, well, you're judging. You shouldn't do that. And so that also is, I thought, well, that's, that's worthy of our study. And again, we have addressed that kind of thing basically in other lessons. But there is a certain kind of judging that is forbidden. Hypocritical judging is forbidden. Again, every passage has a context. And uh, the idea of, of permitting oneself to do things and, and then uh, being hypercritical about others is not saying, well, live and let live. It's you get rid of the beam in your eye. Then you can help your brother who has the mote in his eye. By the way, give not that which is holy to the dogs requires some judging. Beware of false teachers requires judging. John 7, 24 says, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. And that requires judging. So it's right to include that in a listing of misused passages. Here's another one. 
where uh, Jesus is referred to as the firstborn overall creation. Now what happens is our witness friends, what they do with that is, they say, you see there, Jesus is an angel. He is a created being. And it's right to take a passage like that and show what it means and what it doesn't mean. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus is deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 3 says of John 1, All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. Every created thing was made by Jesus. In what sense then is He the firstborn of creation? Well, the word firstborn has more than one usage. It doesn't just mean coming into being. The word firstborn can be used to denote that which has preeminence. Just like in Old Testament law, the firstborn in a family would have certain rights and privileges. Jesus is firstborn over all creation and in the context and the all things he might have the preeminence. But even the book of Colossians itself, you read this in its context, and in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is not a created being. He's like the Father in that he never had a beginning. Like the Holy Spirit who's referred to as the eternal spirit. Well, the fact is none of these are my real point of the sermon this morning. It's just to, it's worth our while to say that there are a lot of passages that are misused and misunderstood. And these are just a few of them. And it's worthy of our time just to take passages that are misused, look at them in their context, see what they mean, see what they don't mean. But I, I, I kept scanning over that uh, uh, list of contents and then I, uh, oh, one other, I was, I was about to forget this one. This is a common one. You know the Bible says money is the root of all evil. What the text says is that the love of money is the root of all evil. Money is just purchasing power. Money can be used for good. It can be used to further the preaching of the gospel. Or it can be used for bad things. It could be used for prostitution. It could be used for drug abuse. Money itself is intrinsically neither good nor bad. It has the power to go either way. But the love of money, even if one doesn't have any money, the love of money is the thing that's condemned. Trusting in money, trusting in riches. Well, but what I started to say is, so all that, you know, that's so far so good. And then I came across this one in the table of contents that says, repent and be baptized. Now, I tell you, that really caught my attention. Because I thought, could it be? Could it be that I've stumbled across a book where an author that I don't know is dealing with a passage that people try to explain away and, and say that baptism has nothing to do with salvation and he's showing the truth on that. I mean, that, that's the way I was approaching it. Here's the passage, Acts 2.38, where in that first gospel sermon, when Peter has shown Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead, appearing to witnesses, ascending into heaven, being made both Lord and Christ. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Here are people that have just been told that they have had part in crucifying not an imposter, but the Son of God. They are convicted of sin. When they heard these things, they were pricked in their heart. When they said, what shall we do? There's no question what they meant. They meant, what shall we do in regard, in regard to what you've just said? What shall we do in regard to, is there any hope for us? Can we, we're in trouble. What, is there any way of escape? What can we do to be saved? It would be the implicit question. And Peter said, repent. He's already called upon them to believe in verse 36 when he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly. If you know something, and you know something assuredly, it would be ridiculous for somebody to say you don't really believe that. If you know it and you know it assuredly, well of course you believe it. You believe it. You know it. You know it's true. 
to know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he's calling on them to know and to know assuredly. That, another way we might put that is to believe something with all of our heart. So he's called upon them to believe, but now when they say, what shall we do? He says, repent. And he says, and let every one of you, not just some of you, every one of you be baptized by whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. For what purpose? For the remission of sins. Is there additionally information there? A promise that's in the passage? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the passage. And so I was going to read the explanation. Since he is saying that this is a commonly misused passage. And he listed it as, the most, as one of the most misused verses in the Bible just like these others that we've just given examples of. But here's what he said. And I, I will tell you that I'm not wanting to be tedious, but I'll tell you something else I don't want to do. I don't want to misrepresent anybody. You never do yourself and you don't do truth a service when you misrepresent somebody. And so this is a, this is a direct quote where he's saying in regard to Acts 2.38 and what he says it means he says, as a way to publicly declare their repentance and faith in a definitive sense, Peter also included the command to be baptized, an outward symbol of the inward cleansing done by God. This would have been a powerful, visible symbol of the sincerity of their... Rep Did you hear anything about a symbol of anything when we read the text? And he keeps calling it a symbol of the sincerity of their repentance. It would vividly picture the spiritual... See, it pictures... It would vividly picture the spiritual cleansing that is taking place as the Spirit washes them of their sin. It is a subsequent act, look at this, that has no saving power in and of itself. I don't know of any gospel preacher that teaches that baptism has power in and of itself. That's building a straw man. For we are saved by faith alone so that no man can boast. And I thought, you talk about irony. Here we have a book talking about the most misused verses in the Bible. And he takes a passage and misuses it. He misapplies it. The author goes on to say, many who read this erroneously conclude that baptism is a necessary condition for salvation. In other words, because Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of sins, some conclude, and they conclude erroneously, he says, that it's necessary for salvation, that baptism is. For Peter did say, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, but to include baptism as a necessary condition for salvation would be to pit this interpretation against the entire teaching of the New Testament where the scriptures clearly teach that we are saved by faith alone. And he gives some passages, may I say, not a one of them contain the expression faith alone. They teach we're saved by faith. And he says, this we cannot do because the Bible does not contradict itself. And so he says, if you accept that baptism is a necessary condition for salvation, then you're going against all the Bible says in other places. And so it, that, th therefore the only conclusion is to call the, repentance is a condition for salvation, but see baptism, that's just, uh, that's just a symbol. That's just picturing what has taken place. If repentance is a condition, the same passage says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. When two things are joined together with a coordinating conjunction such as repent and be baptized, they're linked together, they're joined together. What God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Repentance and baptism were joined together and the text gives the purpose for the remission of sins. And to accept what the Bible teaches there does not contradict. We'll see, in fact, we'll demonstrate how it is consistent with what the Bible teaches. But we're not through just, and here again, to, to just 
I, I would not even take your time to notice these things except for the fact that this is representative of your family that are outside of Christ. And you know that's true. This is representative of people that you work with. And you know that's true. These are, this, this, is, this is just representative of the thinking round about us, isn't it? We, we understand that. So that's, that's why I'm dealing with this. And in that connection, here's something else that's brought up all the time. And I, I'm, I'm just noticing a few things. Again, this is in quotation marks. Furthermore, if baptism were necessary for salvation, then the thief on the cross was not really saved since he did not have time to be baptized before his death. And Jesus would be a liar since he promised him on that day the thief would be with him in paradise. By the way, the author of this book has a Ph.D. And it kind of reminds me when the Sadducees, who were the Ph.D.s of their days, this most of the, from the sect of the Sadducees in Jesus' day, that's where the priests and teachers of the law, many of them came from. The priestly caste was that of the Sadducees. And you remember what Jesus said when they disputed the doctrine of the resurrection in Matthew 22? Jesus says, you don't know the Scriptures nor the power of God. It doesn't matter how many degrees we have. There's a difference in quoting a Scripture and knowing the Scripture. And when you pull out the thief on the cross in connection with what Peter said in Acts 2.38, I don't care if you have a Ph.D. or not. You don't know the Scriptures. Now why do I say that? These are the words of Jesus in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 23. These are the words of Jesus on the cross. There were two thieves, one on either side. On that day Jesus was crucified. There were three deaths. One died in sin. One died to sin. And one died for sin. Are you with me? Jesus died for our sins and would be raised from the dead. There were two thieves. One repented but one did not. So one died in sin. But the one that turned to Jesus and said, Lord remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, Today you shall be with me in paradise. That's a wonderful promise. And a wonderful manifestation of faith. I'll tell you, on that day when Jesus had been scourged and had that thorn of crown on His head, and when He had been beaten and spat upon and abused and mocked and was there on the cross even at this time, He sure didn't look much like a, much like a king. It looked like someone that had been defeated. And yet by faith the thief saw that he really is the Son of God. He is king. He's going, he was going to have his kingdom. And so it's a great manifestation of faith. And when Jesus said those words, again, though it's very close to his death, his death would occur very soon thereafter, nonetheless it is still before his death when he gave those words. Now again we're looking at Scripture, interpreting Scripture, aren't we? We're talking about what's consistent with Scripture. So now we turn to Hebrews chapter 9 to see what light other Scriptures shed on what took place right here. In the book of Hebrews chapter 9, the Bible says in verse 15, speaking of Jesus, and for this reason He is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. For the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. That's important and very basic. But look with me please as we continue reading. For where there is a testament, look at this, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. And further in verse 17, for a testament is of no force at all. while the testator lives. I missed the first part. A testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. 
When did Jesus' testament go into effect? The Bible clearly teaches it was not in effect while he was living. While Jesus was living, the law of Moses was still operative. And then when he died, that's when the law was nailed to the cross. And the new covenant, purchased by his blood, went into effect. Now the terms of the Great Commission that we're talking about, that Peter was preaching in Acts 2.38, that goes back to Jesus giving the Great Commission. In Mark 16, 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. When was that said? Well, the Great Commission was given after Jesus was crucified, after he was raised from the dead, and before he ascended into heaven. Likewise in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And so then when Peter is preaching it in Acts 2, this is the first time anyone has heard that except the apostles that were charged to preach it. This is the very first time these words were proclaimed. So to say Acts 2.38 cannot be teaching we are to be baptized because of the thief on the cross. The Great Commission had not been given yet. How could he have been obedient to Acts 2.38? And so the, the thing that is a contradiction here is indeed pitting one passage against Another, I believe that the thief on the cross was saved. I also believe that the terms of the Great Commission were not yet operative until after that conversation had, had taken place. Well, just a couple of other things, and then what I'm going to do is just go to the Bible and show what the Bible says. But I'm, I'm talking about, again, what, what is commonly believed among us, among our extended family and friends and out in the world and in Protestant denominationalism across the board. And I say this with no animosity at all toward anyone. If I'm wrong, I stand to be corrected. Truth has nothing to fear by investigation. And I want what I say and what I teach people to, to do to be saved to be put to the test. If it's not true, I want to know that. I don't want to teach it. But I'm dealing with what is public information and what is commonly believed. And, and so additionally, when the Philippian jailer, now this is Acts chapter 16. When the jailer said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Philip simply said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And this is where the command stopped. Now it says, baptism then followed only as a testimony to his genuine conversion and the cleansing that he had received. Could we turn to Acts chapter 16? I will tell you, Acts 2.38 is a misused passage, all right. But not in the sense that the author was saying it's misused. In Acts chapter 16, it's true that the Philippian jailer at midnight, verse 25, when Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, and there was an earthquake, and the prisoner thought that the jailer thought prisoners had escaped. He drew a sword to take his life. At verse 27, and Peter, I mean to say Paul, called with a loud voice and said, Sir, do yourself no harm, for we're all here. And that's when he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. And so, is it fair to conclude, see there, he doesn't say be baptized, so baptism has nothing to do with it. Is that a fair treatment of the scripture? The statement is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. How's that going to come about? Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is why the next verse says, the next verse says in verse 32, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and to all who were in his house. That's how faith comes about. And so the word of the Lord was spoken. Well, what happened when the word of the Lord was spoken? He took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. And, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. The same hour of the night. Now here we're told it, it's, it's a testimony to the genuine conversion, but the Bible doesn't say that. 
The Bible doesn't call it a symbol or a picture or a testimony. It just says when they heard the word of the Lord spoken. It says immediately he and all his family were baptized. And this at midnight, verse 25 says. Now, you know, I was reflecting on this passage and preparing for this lesson. And it occurred to me, I have some very fond memories. I'm not saying I like to be awakened at 1 o'clock in the morning, that I just like that. But I'll tell you, over time, I've received phone calls after midnight at 1 o'clock or 1.30. Where someone will say, I can't wait till morning. I know what I need to do. Will you assist me in being baptized? Greg, you and Nancy woke me up with a call like that when Laura was baptized. I remember things like that. And that's happened numerous times. But I'll tell you a phone call I've never received. I've never received a call in the middle of the night to be baptized by someone who thought baptism was a symbol of something, who thought baptism was not a condition of salvation. The people that have called me to be baptized understood that they were doing this as meeting a condition to be saved from their sins, and they couldn't wait any longer. And the practice of those that uh, teach what we're talking about this morning, that it it's, has nothing to do with salvation, it's symbolic, it's a testimony that, you, that you've already been saved. I don't really hear about them baptizing many people at midnight. Do you? In fact, and not to be like ivory soap with a 99 and 44 100s, but I can tell you I've never heard of anybody being baptized the same hour of the night at midnight that thought it had nothing to do with salvation. No, it turns out that Acts 16 is yet another passage that's often misused. And there's one other that I want to notice, and that's 1 Peter 3.21 which is also included in this same chapter, that Peter would later say in one of his letters that it is not the outward act of baptism itself that saves you, but saving faith in Christ Jesus, the kind of faith that cleanses the conscience, and the washing and inner cleansing of our hearts, which includes our conversion, is what baptism is meant to symbolize and represent. So he said that's what Peter said in one of his letters. Now that's what he's saying to you that Peter said. Let me tell you what Peter said. Peter said, there's also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is baptism saves us. That's what the text says. No, if you say, you mean the water in and of itself? Well, no. But Peter says baptism saves us. He's talking about the waters of the flood by which eight souls were saved in the previous passage. He says that that's the antitype of the type. Noah and his family were saved through water. And he's saying that's the antitype. Baptism is the type. It prefigures that we're saved through baptism. Baptism saves us. He says not the removal of the filth of the flesh. It's not a, no, it's not a physical cleansing that might occur from removing any dirt and so forth, uncleanness as one is immersed and raised up. But the answer of a good conscience toward God, you know what that means? That's an inquiry. That's when a person wants to know, how can I have a good conscience? Well, here's the answer. This is the answer of a good conscience toward God. And to make sure no one misunderstands, it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ because He lives that we can be raised to walk in newness of life. You want to know what to do to be saved? Here's the answer. This is the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now you can look at 1 Peter 3.21 and say baptism just symbolizes and it typifies, but the text says baptism saves us. Now I want to qualify that. From the standpoint that as we look at the sense in which baptism saves us, to me it's a very simple point to be made that should remove any misunderstanding. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
When does the blood of Jesus wash away my sins? When one is scripturally baptized. Baptism is not the what, it's the when. And that's what it has to do with salvation. I trust that you understand my approach is to carefully and correctly represent someone that I believe is misusing a scripture to better equip you when others make these same kind of arguments. But additionally and in conclusion, here's what the Bible says. The Bible does teach that we're saved by faith. But the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. In Romans 6 verse 17, would you turn with me to Romans 6? In Romans 6 verse 17, Paul said, Thanks be to God that whereas you were the servants of sin, that you became obedient from the heart to that form of doctrine unto which you were delivered. And being, and being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Oh, what a difference the gospel makes. They were servants of sin, but they became obedient to that tupas, to that pattern, to that form of doctrine to which they were delivered. And being made free from sin, they became servants of righteousness. Have you turned to Romans 6? Notice what's above that, several verses above. In verse 3 of Romans 6, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Verse 4, Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism and into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Here's a passage that's talking about salvation. It's a passage that's talking about obedient faith. It's a passage talking about the grace of God. But again the question is, we're saved by the grace of God. We're saved by faith. But when are we saved by the grace of God by our faith? When does that happen? We were buried with Him in baptism, through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Nobody talked about faith more than Paul. Nobody exalted the grace of God more than Paul. But when he's talking about that point at which we are saved, clearly he says, we were baptized into Christ. We were baptized into His death. We were buried with Him in baptism. And when we were raised from that watery grave, we were raised to walk in newness of life. That's what the Bible says. And that doesn't contradict any passage that talks about faith or repentance or confession or, or anything else. With a heart man believes unto righteousness. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Repentance is granted unto life. Acts 11, verse 18. Confession is made unto salvation. But I'll tell you what you won't find. You won't find a passage that says we believe into Christ or that we repent into Christ or that we confess into Christ. But you'll find passages that say that the one has, who has done that, those things, is baptized into Christ. And so not every passage that mentions baptism states its purpose. But we go to those passages that do state its purpose and state what happens to, to understand the purpose. We don't go to passages that mention faith and don't say anything about baptism. If we want to understand the purpose of baptism, we go to passages like Romans 6 that deal with its purpose. The Apostle Paul was obedient in Acts 22 verse 16. Here's what the passage says. Ananias asked him this question, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And Acts 9 and verse 18 says, And he arose and was baptized. Acts 22, 16 records the command. Acts 9, 18 records his obedience to the command. A lot of people say, well, Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. No, he was not. He saw the resurrected Christ. That was essential to qualify him to be an apostle. He came to believe Jesus is the Son of God. He's not an imposter. And God gave him three days to think about that before Ananias came. But Saul was still in his sins. And he needed to have his sins washed away by the blood of Christ. 
by calling on the name of the Lord. At what point did that happen? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Remember what I said? Baptism is not the what, it's the when. The what is the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. That's Ephesians 1 7. So it's the blood of Christ. He died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. But when does the blood of Christ wash away our sins? And it's when one is scripturally baptized. And that's what Acts 2 is, verse 38 is talking about. It's at that point that one receives the remission of every past sin. It's at that point that one is added by the Lord to the church. As Acts 2 verse 47 says, the Lord added daily to the church such as were being saved. It's at that point that we're translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. It's at that point we can sing, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Oh what a difference the gospel makes. But my purpose this morning is not just to seek to equip you to answer error and teach and know and teach the truth. But at this point it's also to encourage any who have not yet obeyed the gospel to see the urgency. Don't delay. Come to the Lord as we stand and sing.